Good morning. We'll be taking of the Lord's Supper in just a moment. Uh, just a reminder, we do use, if you're visiting with us, we do use the little individual servings. If you did not get one of these, they're sitting on the table in the middle of the foyer. Uh, you have time to go out and get one, or if you raise your hand, uh, we'll see that someone brings you one. Uh, before we partake, I have a few uh, thoughts, a few comments. And to begin with, I would just like to read a couple of passages and see what Christ says. Christ himself has to say about this supper and what Paul has to say about it. So we're going to turn to Matthew, the 26th chapter. And in Matthew 26, in just a second, I'm going to begin with the 20, uh, 26th verse. Matthew 26, 26 through 30. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day, when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Also over in 1 Corinthians 11, when addressing the Corinthians regarding the taking of the Lord's Supper, beginning with the 23rd verse, 1 Corinthians 11, 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So why do we do what we're about to do at this time? Why do we partake of the Lord's Supper? And one reason that we partake is because we are partaking of the sacrifice, and it's this sacrifice which was offered for the forgiveness of our sins. A second reason that we partake is that we remember Jesus. We see this in Luke 22, the last part of the 19th verse. Jesus said, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we just saw Paul quote that verse, uh, or that quote that statement here in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five that we are to do this in remembrance of Jesus. So that's a second purpose in this Lord's Supper is to remember him. But at the end of what we read in Corinthians, Paul introduces Yet a third reason that we do this, Paul says in verse 26, that we proclaim the Lord's death, saying, for as often as you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. But I, I don't think that we usually think of this as a proclamation. We often fo focus on the remembrance aspect of it, and we focus on the fact that what we were remembering when we remember Jesus is first and foremost we're remembering his sacrifice and that that sacrifice is for our sins. But we don't necessarily think of ourselves as making a proclamation in that we take of the Lord's Supper. But it is a proclamation because that's what Paul says. And I think there is a number of people that we're proclaiming this to. I think in one sense, we're proclaiming it to ourselves. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, it reinforces in our minds uh, and in our hearts, why we are here and why this is so important. I think we're also proclaiming it to each other, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We are being an encouragement to one another uh, as we see each other do this, which is probably part of the reason why we do it together. This is not part of our worship that we do at home. This is something we always come together to do as the assembly so that we can each uh, edify one another in doing it. But we are also making a proclamation to the world. We are proclaiming Christ's death, not just to ourselves and to each other. We are proclaiming it to everyone. 
And we do that in one way because we often have visitors. We have people who are not of the body of Christ who may come among us and see us doing this. But it wouldn't be much of a proclamation if the only people who saw it are those who happened to be here while we were doing it. So this is also a proclamation to the world. And that's because even though the world isn't here, the world knows that we're doing this. People who aren't Christians, people who aren't of the body, know that taking of the Lord's Supper is something that Christians do, and it's something that we do often. And because of that knowledge, because they know that we are doing this, we're making a statement to them. We're telling them something. And there are things that we're telling them that there's some things we want them to know about the death of Jesus. So real quickly, I just wanted to look at some of the things that I think that we are proclaiming about Jesus' death when we partake of the Lord's Supper. One thing that we want to proclaim about the death of Jesus is that it was prophesied. One example would be Isaiah 53, the seventh verse. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, and he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And not only was it prophesied in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well, before it occurs, Jesus is already predicting it to his disciples. In Matthew 17, verses 22 and 23, Jesus told them, Now, there were, now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up, and they were exceedingly sorrowful. Another thing we proclaim is that Jesus died willingly, looking at John 10, verses 17 and 18. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. We also want the world to know that Jesus' death was painful. It was a matter of suffering, and it was something that he dreaded suffering. Go back to Matthew 26 again, and this time beginning in the 36th verse. I want to look at Jesus' thoughts as he prays about his coming crucifixion, beginning with verse 36. Then when Jesus came to them to a place called Gethsemane, he said to the disciples, sit here while I go down and pray over there. And he took with him Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The death that Jesus was about to suffer was the excruciating one of Roman crucifixion. It was not something that Jesus wanted to do. He was willing to do it, and he did it willingly because it was the will of the Father and because he wanted to do the will of the Father. But it was a horrible ordeal that he did not want to have to suffer. But most importantly, the thing that we want to proclaim is that his death takes away sin. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That means that he did not die to make atonement for his own sins, as he had none. He rather died to make atonement for ours. And it's because of the sacrifice that we can have forgiveness of our sins and that we can be reconciled to our Father. As we not only proclaim these things, we wish to remember these things and reflect on these things as we partake of the Lord's Supper.
At this time, we will partake of the bread, but first I'll offer a prayer. Father, we thank you for this bread that Jesus calls his body. We pray that as we partake, we will reflect back upon Jesus's life, upon his ministry, upon his love for us, and most of all, upon his sacrifice that he made willingly for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we pray that you would be with each of us as that we partake, that you would help us to do so in a worthy manner, and that we would be an encouragement to one another, and that we would be shining lights of the world as we do this, Father. This is a prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.